They was not scared of Suge Knight. They was terrified of Suge Knight. Right. I mean, terrified. I know. No. To death. When you hear the name Shook Knight, you think of intimidation, fear, and domination. You simply know this six foot two, tall, cigar smoking, bearded man is someone you don't want to mess with. In the world of hip hop, Shook Knight, whose real name is Marion Hugh Knight Jr., is often seen as a scary figure. You know that things will get ugly when he's around. No wonder a lot of people in the industry fear him, except for one rapper who didn't back down from Shook. During the golden age of hip hop, he became a major figure and had a lot of power on the streets and in the music business. And with his record label, Death Row Records, he became a major force in the music business, building a roster of famous singers that included Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, and Tupac Shakur. But among the intimidation and the constant ego tripping, there was just one rapper who didn't back down when he was around. As a matter of fact, he stood tall, ready to fight if necessary. Of course, we are talking about Curtis Jackson, better known as 50 Cent. Even though 50 Cent had been through a lot and was shot nine times, Shook's image didn't bother him. Before getting into the music business, Shook Knight worked as an event promoter and a bodyguard for famous people. His ambition and cruel personality, on the other hand, helped him become a record boss. Shook made a big step forward in 1989 when he started his music production company. This was his first step into the business side of the music world. Dealing with business was easy for Shook from the start. Do what he says or face the results. People in the business saw him as a dangerous figure because he wouldn't give in and was always looking for ways to make more money. Shook himself summed up his attitude by saying that he wanted everything and would do anything to get what he wanted. One of the first times Shook's straightforward attitude was shown was when he dealt with Vanilla Ice, the famous rapper who sang the hit song, Ice Ice Baby. Mario Johnson, Shook's client, had helped make the song, and he wanted a cut of the money that the song made when it became popular. Shook approached Vanilla Ice at his Beverly Hills Hotel with six intimidating bodyguards in a dramatic show of force. The situation quickly turned aggressive when Shook's men beat up Vanilla Ice's group to show who was in charge. Shook led Vanilla Ice to the balcony of the hotel room, which had a view of a very high place, and made a scary threat. The scene on the balcony showed how Shook usually gets what he wants, a smart mix of intimidating and forcing people to do what he wants. With the threat of hurting Vanilla Ice physically in mind, Shook ordered that he follow through, showing that he was ready to use force to get what he thought was his. He took me out on the balcony, started talking to me personally. On the balcony? On the balcony, high above, like 15 floors. He had me look over the edge, show me how high I was up there. You scared? <laughs> I needed to wear a diaper on that day. <laughs> I was very scared. Following his victory over Vanilla Ice, Shook Knight's goals only grew bigger. With his newfound money and growing reputation for being scary, he set out to start his own record label, and changed the way the music business worked. Shook's road to starting Death Row Records was paved with moves that were both smart and violent. When Shook met the rapper The Doc, who was trying to get out of his deal with Ruthless Records, it was a turning point in his life. Through The Doc, Shook made friends with important NWA players, like the famous Dr. Dre Shook saw a chance to grow his already huge business empire and set up a series of fights and talks to free Dr. Dre from his contractual obligations. NWA manager Jerry Heller said that Shook and his friends used threats of violence, like carrying lead pipes and baseball bats, to get Easy e and others to break their contracts with Dr. Dre and the doc. While Shook was putting constant pressure on Easy e he finally gave in. This made it possible for Death Row Records to start up. Shook, the doc -y and Dr. Dre started Death Row Records in 1991. It quickly became a giant in the music business, ready to change the way hip-hop is made. When Death Row Records was founded, it was a turning point in the history of rap music. It caused a huge shift in the balance of power in the business. With Dr. Dre's unmatched production skills and Shook's smart business sense running the label, it quickly became famous attracting a group of top artists and dominating the charts with its groundbreaking releases. The fact that Shook Knight was able to co-found Death Row Records made him an even more powerful figure in the music business. 
He was known as a scary man who could control the business by sheer force of will and fear. As Death Row Records became more well-known, Shook's impact grew, changing the face of hip-hop and leaving an indelible mark on its past. Death Row could be bigger than Motown or Sony or Warner Brothers. Death Row is going to be the biggest record company there is. The master plan was to take over. Shook Knight wanted Death Row Records to be the Motown of the 1990s, and his plan worked out great. By making a deal with Interscope Records to distribute his music, Shook started a record label that would change the way hip-hop was made and leave a lasting mark on music history. Death Row Records quickly became the biggest name in the business, and both their peers and rivals looked up to and envied them. Some of the most important and well-known acts of the time, like Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg, were signed to the label. Their groundbreaking albums cemented Death Row's reputation for releasing timeless classics. The Chronic, Dr. Dre's groundbreaking album that came out in December 1992, broke rules and set new standards for how well hip-hop music should be done. The Chronic was a musical manifesto. It combined new beats, catchy hooks, and sharp words to make a groundbreaking work that people all over the world could relate to. With catchy songs like Nothing But A G Thang and an honest look at West Coast gang culture, the album cemented Dr. Dre's reputation as a visionary producer and put Death Row Records at the top of the rap scene. Still, Death Row's rise was far from over. The label put out another masterpiece in November 1993, Snoop Dogg's first record, Doggy Style. When Snoop Dogg came on the scene with swagger and style, his smooth flow, laid-back delivery, and unmatched charisma wowed fans. From the moment it came out, Doggy Style captivated audiences. It shot to the top of the Billboard 200 list and received high praise from both critics and fans. Doggy Style became an instant hit thanks to its catchy grooves, hooks, and honest lyrics. It made Snoop Dogg even more of a cultural icon and made Death Row Records even more of a powerhouse in the music business. Together, The Chronic and Doggy Style changed the face of hip-hop and paved the way for Death Row's continued success in the years to come, leaving a lasting mark that lives on today. In 1995, Shook Knight, the very powerful head of Death Row Records, brought Tupac Shakur into the company. Tupac was given an eight-month sentence out of a three-year term for sexual assault. His release was sped up when Shook Knight paid off his $1.4 million bond, showing his power and wealth. In return, Tupac signed a deal with Death Row Records, joining the band's other famous rap artists. The success of this relationship was quickly seen when Tupac's masterpiece, All Eye On Me, came out in February 1996. The record, a huge two-disc work of art, not only showed off Tupac's unmatched lyrical skills, but it also captured the spirit of the West Coast rap scene. All Eyes On Me went straight to number one on the Billboard 200 chart and became an instant hit, making Death Row even more of a force in the music business. Death Row Records, led by Shook Knight, became associated with excess and violence during this rapid rise to fame. Shook had complete control over the label and she used threats, violence, and a lack of respect for social norms to do so. People who worked for Shook say that his management style was very scary and that workers would face serious consequences for even small mistakes. Reports of beatings, humiliations, and degrading acts, like making an employee drink urine, showed that Death Row's offices was a very bad place to work. Shook Knight's reign of fear went beyond Death Row Records, and he had many run-ins with the law during his tough time in power. Shook got five years of probation in 1995 for attacking two rappers at a recording studio. This shows how violent he was and how little he cared about the law. Shook was also very hostile toward executives of competing record labels. He got into public fights and verbal sparring matches with them, which added to his image as the most feared person in hip-hop at the time. Even though Death Row had a huge amount of money thanks to selling multi-platinum albums and making money in other businesses, Shook Knight's bad side cast a long shadow over the label's history. Death Row Records had a lot of success, but its rise was hampered by a culture of fear, intimidation, and crime that was kept going by its mysterious and scary boss, Shook Knight. 
Any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star, don't want to, don't want to have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the video, all on the record, dancing. Come to Death Row. Shook Knight got into trouble with the law again in 1996 when he was sent to jail for breaking the terms of his probation. This crime happened because of a fight where Shook, Tupac Shakur, and their group reportedly attacked Crips member Orlando Anderson. Even though Shook was given a nine-year term for breaking his probation, he was let out of jail after only four years. But this run-in with the law was just the start of more trouble with the law. In 2003, Shook Knight got into trouble again because he broke his parole. This time, he was charged with beating a parking lot worker. Repeated violations like these showed how violent and careless Shook was with the law, which hurt his already bad image even more. At this point, Shook and his record label, Death Row Records, were linked to crime and murder. The fact that Shook was involved with the notorious mob Piru Blood Street Gang made him and his record label seem even more dangerous. Many of the people he hired to work for Death Row Records were real gangsters, which added to the label's image as a place where a lot of illegal things happen. Because of the bad vibes at Death Row Records, Dr. Dre, one of the label's most famous artists and producers, finally left. In 1996, Dr. Dre broke up with Death Row and started his own record company called Aftermath Records. This was a turning point in the history of hip-hop because Dr. Dre wanted to make a new style of music that wasn't as harmful as Death Row's music was when Shook Knight was in charge. Aftermath Records quickly became Death Row's main rival, with a roster of skilled artists and producers, thanks to Dr. Dre's leadership. Curtis James Jackson, better known as 50 Cent, a young rapper from South Jamaica, Queens, was one of the most important artists the label signed. With Dr. Dre's help and advice, 50 Cent became one of the best-selling hip-hop acts of all time, making Aftermath Records even stronger as a leader in the business. Famed rapper and record producer Eminem found 50 Cent's Guess Who's Back mixtape by accident in 2002. He was quickly blown away by the young rapper's raw talent and potential. Eminem quickly signed 50 Cent to Shady Records, a branch of Dr. Dre's Aftermath label, seeing it as a chance to help a rising star. With the help of two of hip-hop's most important players, 50 Cent started on the path that would make him a superstar. When 50 Cent got his record deal, he left a lasting mark on the music business, making sure that his name would go down in hip-hop history. When his first studio record, Get Rich or Die Tryin', came out in 2003, it smashed the charts like no other, starting at number one on the prestigious Billboard 200 chart. The album's soaring success was shown by the fact that it was certified nine times platinum, which shows how popular and talented 50 Cent is. Get Rich or Die Tryin' was more than just a hit song. It became a part of culture. A lot of hit songs came from the album, like 21 Questions, Many Men, Patiently Waiting, and the famous anthem In Da Club. These number one songs not only ruled the airwaves, but they also made 50 Cent one of the most famous acts of the early 2000s. During the huge success of Get Rich or Die Tryin', 50 Cent met Shook Knight, the notorious music boss and former Death Row Records mogul, which turned out to be very bad. During the shooting of the famous music video for In Da Club, Shook Knight showed up on set out of the blue, acting dangerous and cocky as usual. As usual, Shook Knight arrived with a huge group of people, with eyewitnesses putting the number of people there at around 30. There was a lot of stress in the air, but 50 Cent didn't seem to care. He showed a strong resolve and unwavering confidence in the face of trouble. Yeah, yeah, like I, I was like, what happened? I remember the time, actually, it's funny, because he came, it was like, Shook's outside! Shook's outside! Everybody like, Shook's outside! He was running, dropping shit, like, man, everybody going, Pow. I'm in front of the camera. Even though there was a lot of noise and chaos when Shook Knight walked in, 50 Cent stood firm in the middle of it all. While most of the cast and crew were scared and panicked, 50 Cent stayed incredibly calm, showing an amazing lack of fear when he saw the famous music mogul. When Shook Knight and 50 Cent finally met, the scene was tense, and both men gave off an air of steely purpose. In a moment that would come to define his unwavering determination, 50 Cent spoke to Shook Knight in a calm voice, free of any fear or worry. What's up, man? was a simple but direct question. 
What do you want to do? 50 Cent showed that he was always ready to face the scary person in front of him. Reports say that 50 Cent may have been even less afraid because he took an extra step of safety. According to some reports, 50 Cent took an Uzi out of his car as a safety step to make himself stronger in case he had to fight Shook Knight. Even though there was a lot of tension in the air, the standoff between 50 Cent and Shook Knight didn't end in violence or a fight. Instead, it finished with an unexpected letdown. When 50 Cent spoke directly to Shook Knight, he responded with his usual lack of interest. Shook took a slow drag from his cigar, looked at his partner with some consideration, and then left without a fuss. And I just remember smurfing 50, 50 was like, what's up, man, what you wanna do? Bang him. Yeah, bang him was like, bang what you wanna do? Mm -hmm. And Shook looked at him, and he took a puff of cigar, and he blew it out, and he did like this, and he left. Even though this was the only time Shook Knight and 50 Cent ever met, it's clear that 50 was never scared or felt threatened by him. Some people hid because they were afraid of Shook, but 50 stood his ground and was never scared. He may have been brave, which is why Shook Knight never bothered him again.